encourage you to do so, so that your network can see this event and learn more about this lawsuit. Hello. Oh, mute yourself, Trey. Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us this evening for this uh, timely conversation on the Pennsylvania uh, lawsuit. And uh, we hope that you will find this to be an important conversation to learn more about this issue um, and why it's relevant to our students in the Southeastern region. Um, before we um, introduce our presidency of the Urban League of Philadelphia, once again, my name is Thomas Rebella. I serve as the Director of Advocacy and Communications. I want to first thank our promotional partners that have stepped up to help amplify this event. This includes the Education Law Center, the Public Interest Law Center, uh, Philly Clue, which is the Coalition of Labor Union Women, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Pennsylvania Chapter, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Row Chapter, uh, Pennsylvania Youth Vote, the Pennsylvania NAACP, NAACP uh, PA State uh, Conference, the 100 Black Men of Philadelphia, and the Ch uh, Chester Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. At this time, I wanna uh, have our President and CEO, Andrea Custis, uh, join the screen to provide some brief remarks on the Urban League and its, and its role in this effort. On Good evening. Thank you so much, Thomas. Let me also give my um, sincere appreciation to the Public Interest Law Center and to the Education Law Center um, for taking the time to explain this to the public. I, I know I don't have to say to many of our viewers, this lawsuit is critical to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, not just to Southeastern um, Pennsylvania, but to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And just really quickly, if we look at how we do funding for schools, it is a disgrace. It is outdated information from 1990. I believe things have changed. There have been districts who have shrunk and districts who have grown, but yet we are taking the majority of our money and doing it through no harmless. So it, to me, it's antiquated. It's all 11% of it goes through the, um, the, the formula. This certainly changes things. Um, I think every individual, every parent, every legislator, every student, everybody needs to listen well tonight to understand it. It is my hope that we explain things so that a student that is in the 12th grade understands what this lawsuit is and how important it is to them in education. As a black woman, as a head of a civil rights organization, we have left the, the Commonwealth and in particular Philadelphia and other areas with inequities that are shameful over decades. I believe that this will be groundbreaking in terms of the outcome of, of this case. I am so thankful to both of these law um, advocacy people who are handling this. I cannot say enough to um, the two of you. So on behalf of the Urban League of Philadelphia, thank you for all your work. Thank you for caring about how all kids get educated. And thank you for caring and understanding the, the inequities that little black kids and little Latino kids experience every day with not an opportunity to really work and accomplish things through their full potential. So on behalf of the Urban League of Philadelphia, thank you and thank all the people who are taking time out of their busy schedule to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Thomas. Great, thank you very much, Andrea. Once again, as a reminder, you should see the link in the chat 
we will be, um, we are live on Facebook. So feel free to share this conversation to your Facebook page, follow the link to do so. I'm not sure if he's joined yet, but I do want to thank Senator Vincent Hughes for helping to amplify this event with, um, with the community. Um, um, if he's not here now, we'll make sure to give him a few minutes towards the end to provide some remarks, but we definitely want to acknowledge the Senator for his uh, commitment to this issue and his uh, fight and his constant fight for education funding and making sure that the Commonwealth is supported. So at this time, we will turn it over to both the Public Interest Law Center and Education Law Center to uh, begin this conversation. So I will turn it over to Maura McInerney and Michael Churchill, who will uh, lead us in this conversation. Well, good evening. I'm, I'm Michael Churchill and I'm gonna be starting uh, the conversation uh, to talk about uh, how we got into this situation. And uh, Maura is going to tell us uh, about the activities of the lawsuit and how we can get out of it. Uh, uh, the topic is really about education funding in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's inadequate, inequitable, and unconstitutional. And uh, we should add to it, as uh, Andrea so uh, eloquently said, shameful, disgraceful, uh, and um, uh, intolerable. And uh, the fact that it has existed this long is uh, really uh, uh, a testimony uh, to uh, uh, all of the needs that uh, for a lawsuit uh, to make sure that it never happens again. Um, I do want to say that uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, but uh, I and Maura both represent uh, a large team from our own firms uh, and from a uh, uh, private firm of, of, of Melvinie uh, and Myers that are helping to put this lawsuit together. This is a team effort and it is backed up by the advocacy of groups like uh, that are helping to amplify this conversation tonight. So uh, you can find out about the Education Law Center and the Public Interest Law Center uh, from uh, our websites and I encourage you to do so. Uh, what is the problem? Uh, the source of it uh, is that uh, the state has no goal of actually fully funding schools. And if you don't ask how much they need, you'll never give it, of course. Uh, that is, uh, uh, goes along with the fact that the state's contribution to the cost of education is uh, really low, and we'll discuss that uh, uh, further in a moment. Uh, the problem is uh, amplified uh, by the fact that uh, the funding that the state has, although there has a uh, fair funding formula, most of the funding that goes to the schools is not actually based on that formula. Uh, and the underlying consequences of those factors are that the low wealth communities, uh, communities uh, uh, of color and poor people uh, that uh, need uh, the most uh, funding, uh, they who actually try the hardest and make the greatest effort uh, actually have the least resources uh, for education in their communities. Uh, let me ask you uh, who you think said uh, that Pennsylvania has significant financial inequities in its system of school funding with one of the largest gaps of any state in the country in per child spending between the Commonwealth's poorest and its wealthiest districts. Uh, I, you, you know a lot of advocates have been saying that, but who else? Uh, not only does it have uh, some of the biggest gaps on the input side, but it has some of the biggest gaps on the output side. The Commonwealth also has some of the most significant reading achievement gaps between low-income students and students of color and their white, more affluent peers. Well, uh, it's not just the advocates, it's actually the state itself in its uh, uh, plan that it submits to the federal government. Uh, the importance of this is uh, all of the things that we're going to talk to you about tonight and that most of the things we will talk about in the trial itself uh, are public knowledge right there in everybody's face. The problem is we haven't done anything about it. This is from August 1st, 2019, but it's been a problem that has been around for a long time under uh, more than one administration uh, and hasn't been solved. So to go back to the point of the state's low contribution. Uh, here you see a graph that shows every state in the union. Uh, Pennsylvania is on this one about seventh lowest. Uh, some years, I think uh, the year after this 
graph was done. Actually, uh, we were third lowest. Uh, as long as I've been looking, we've been in the lowest seven or eight uh, in the country. We are outliers. And the consequences of that is that the burden falls on uh, the local uh, districts. Uh, funding for school districts come either from the state, from the federal government, which puts in usually very little, uh, or uh, the local district itself. Uh, and so every dollar that doesn't come from the state has to come from uh, uh, taxpayers in the community. And here you can see uh, how that actually plays out. This is one county uh, with a uniform tax system. Uh, and you can see uh, the great variety in tax burdens and what happens. Uh, tax burdens equalized mills really is uh, the cost per thousand dollars of, of uh, market value. Uh, and so uh, for every $100,000, uh, Chester Upland, for instance, taxpayers uh, pay $227. Uh, uh, you'll see uh, Marple Newtown in right. Uh, their taxpayers pay $130 per $100,000 uh, of, uh, of, uh, I mean, per, uh, of uh, taxable property. Uh, and with that, tax rate, they can raise $21,000 per student. Uh, William Penn's school district, which is uh, uh, one of our clients in this case, has a tax rate that is two and a half times higher than uh, Marple Newtown. Uh, and as you can see, and, uh, they raise uh, less, than ha uh, less than half, probably closer to a third, $8,815. Philadelphia, to give you a sense of, uh, of there, has a tax rate uh, of 24 uh, mills, uh, and they only raise $7,700 uh, per student. Uh, to give you a sense of what this means, the median tax rate in the state is about 18.8 .8 mills. So uh, William Penn and Philadelphia, uh, the poor districts are taxing the, their uh, uh, community the highest. What happens with that money? Uh, here's an example. If you look at uh, New Hope, uh, which is uh, in Bucks County and is one of the richest districts in the state, it has a tax rate of 12.6 mills. Uh, it can raise $25,000 uh, with that money. Uh, the state gives it $4,600 and they have a total of $30,000 per child. Reading, which is not far away, uh, and is what is almost the poorest district in the state, has a tax rate twice New Hope's and raises 10% of what New Hope does, $2,500. Look at that difference. The state does have a progressive tax system itself. It gives uh, a rating uh, two and a half times as much as New Hope. It gets $10,000, but together, state and local, it has $13,000. Uh, per child with a difference of $16,000. That in a nutshell is the problem in Pennsylvania. The state doesn't give up enough money to make up for the difference in the wealth that, that um, uh, you can see here. And uh, who needs the, the, the most money in this case? Let's look at which district needs more. New Hope only has less than 10% of its students in poverty. Reading has 94% of its students in poverty. New Hope has less than 3% English learners. Reading has more than 26% English learners. Everyone knows that it costs more. The state even acknowledges it costs more to educate students who are in poverty, who are English language learners, and who uh, 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 have disabilities and a number of other uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, and uh, but the, unfortunately, the money doesn't follow the need. So let's look at William Penn School District that we looked at a, a minute ago, one of our clients with about less than uh, 5,700 students. The 34.6 uh, equalized mills is the highest in the fourth highest in Pennsylvania. Uh, they are uh, way behind in what they need uh, according to the state formula. Uh, for adequacy, which Moore is going to talk more about in her section, uh, and the consequences is they have 
uh, elementary school classes that had more than 30 students in a class. Not an easy way to learn. So um, Andrea mentioned uh, that the formula is uh, that we have uh, reflects uh, 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 old, old demographics and it actually goes back uh, to uh, 1991, uh, which uh, because since then, uh, every year uh, the formulas, uh, the amount of money that school districts get have incorporated uh, the prior year's funding. And that prior year base was from 1991. It's about uh, somewhere in the uh, over 80% uh, of the funding uh, that you school districts get now actually started uh, in 1991. <coughs> That was a long time ago, as you can see here with the pictures of Gorbachev and Bush, uh, who were in office, uh, Barack Obama, who was uh, still at law school, and LeBron James, who was not even yet uh, playing uh, uh, basketball. So uh, what is that formula that's been locked in? It was enacted in uh, 2016. It uh, is uh, for the basic education uh, funding. Uh, it actually distributes money to school districts based on what is called weighted students that takes into account uh, the actual count of students. That's a good thing. Uh, what percentage of them are in poverty and English learners and other factors. Uh, the problem is though, uh, that all it does is decide how to split the pie up, not how big the pie should be. Uh, and it ex purposefully excluded asking the question, how much money do school districts need? So that means uh, essentially uh, that uh, the formula uh, pits uh, one district against another uh, for the same amount of money. Uh, and uh, uh, even worse, uh, it only applies to money uh, since uh, that's been appropriated since uh, uh, 2016 when the formula was adopted. Uh, that's what's meant by uh, hold harmless. Uh, all districts will get everything they had in 2015. They will be held harmless and not have any loss uh, of that money. Uh, that means uh, only 11% of the basic ed funding money runs through the formula. Uh, and when you think about it, basic ed is only half of the state funding. Uh, that means uh, only less than 6% is uh, running through the formula. And um, uh, the state share is uh, less than 60% of, uh, uh, I mean, there's only 38% of the uh, total funding. So you can see uh, that actually very little money is going through, uh, of the school funding is going through this uh, formula. Uh, the fact that it has a hold harmless uh, number in it uh, means that there is a $1.2 billion worth of inequity that is baked in the formula, which, which means that if all of the money actually in the, uh, in the state appropriations for basic education actually went through the formula, $1.2 billion would go to different districts than it goes to now. The problem is uh, that that makes it like the Hunger Games where one district fights another. Let me show you what it actually means. Uh, this is the list of districts who would get the most money per student if all of the basic education money went through the formula. York would get $46 million more than it gets now. Allentown would get $101 million. Reading, $87 million. Uh, and you can see the whole list here through the uh, top 10. Every one of the districts on that top 10 list is a majority minority district. Uh, it is the poor urban black and brown districts that are having the most money taken from them by not using the formula uh, for the entire appropriations. The problem is there are only 164 districts that are owed money uh, if you run it through the formula and there are 340 districts uh, that are making out very well uh, under hold harmless. And here you can see uh, the districts that benefit the most, uh, small rural districts uh, that have been, for the most part, losing population, 
uh, and uh, but are still getting the same amount of money now than they were getting uh, 30 years ago. Uh, why does it matter? Because uh, the districts that are being underfunded uh, do not have uh, the resources that they need uh, so that the, they can upgrade their buildings, that they can make them safe, uh, so that they can provide the equipment that is needed as we saw from the, the COVID crisis, uh, who were the last districts to be able to actually uh, be up and running uh, with technology uh, were uh, the very underfunded districts that we're talking about. And the other reason why it matters, of course, is what it does to our students. Statewide, the PSSA results show students uh, are not doing well. Uh, more than 65% uh, or 67% of, of eighth graders are scoring below a uh, proficient in math, uh, almost 40 cents, 40% uh, scoring below basic, uh, a little better in English arts, but not much. 40% uh, are, are, are below proficient. Uh, and the Keystone exams show the same large numbers of students who are not able to meet state standards and presumably are not college and career ready, which is the goal of our system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the pain is not distributed equally. Uh, the college uh, graduation and college attendance uh, and college graduation is much lower for graduates from low spending districts than they are from the high spending districts. Uh, and this is not just because they have low income students. Uh, when you look at the college attendance and graduation rates of the low income students in the wealthy districts, they are doing much better than the, than the students who are attending the low spending districts. Not surprising, uh, uh, but we now have a solid proof of that uh, uh, proposition. But uh, so these facts have been known for many, many years. Uh, what is being done about it? Uh, when the governor uh, Wolf came into office uh, six years ago, uh, seven years ago almost, uh, he said that the state was going to uh, increase its appropriations in four years by $2 billion. Uh, well, uh, over six years, uh, the appropriations have totaled uh, 698 million increase for basic education uh, funding. Uh, that is uh, when you look at inflation, actually a decrease of $101 million for the entire state. Uh, and during this time period, the difference in the uh, spending uh, and the resources of the high wealth district and the low wealth districts increased. So there's a bigger gap between the, 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 the well-to-do and the poor. And um, that problem is getting worse uh, rather than better. Uh, so it is for that reason that uh, in 2014, uh, we started representing uh, the uh, uh, districts uh, and, uh, and, and other plaintiffs that Laura Mora is going to discuss. And for that reason, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thanks very much, Michael. Hi, everybody. Maura McInerney from the Education Law Center. Really excited to be here. I'm going to talk about the school funding case, where we are in the case, when we brought it, why we brought it is obviously clear from uh, Michael's overview. And I want to go back to the first slide where Michael talked about the fact that there are so many issues that we haven't even addressed in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That includes identifying what kids need to learn and adequacy targets and all of that, and ensuring that we are providing an equitable system whereby all students in all zip codes are receiving a quality education. So we brought this lawsuit in November of 2014, um, and we are bringing two claims. So one is what's called an education clause. It exists in every single state constitution across the country. This is what our specific education clause says. General Assembly shall provide and, and uh, for the maintenance and support of a thorough and efficient system of public education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth. So that education clause mandates that the General Assembly adequately support and maintain a system that will serve all students across the Commonwealth. And we allege in our complaint that they have not done that. 
Interestingly, we're one of the few states that adds this pr provision that says to serve the needs of the Commonwealth, which we think is important. We're talking here about the education that students receive in, in our schools. We're also talking about the benefit to the Commonwealth as a whole of having students who receive a quality education, who graduate college and career ready, which is the state standard in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I think I just lost the slides. I see Michael, uh, I don't know where they went, but I'll keep talking. So two, two uh, specific claims. One is that education clause, so that goes to the issue of adequacy. The second claim is actually our equal protection claim. And what we allege in that particular claim is that the uh, General Assembly has created a, a gross disparity between high wealth and low wealth school districts that cannot be justified by any state interest. And we're back. So the equal protection claim actually says that in order to have, if we have such a gross disparity, you have to be able to justify that by some interest. We anticipate that they may say it's a local interest, local people are determining how much is spent on education. We know that that is bull, right? Because as Michael demonstrated, we have a lot of low wealth school districts that are taxing people two times, four times as much, and they cannot obtain the resources to meet the needs of students. So we know that's not true. So we're looking at the equal protection because what we've alleged is this in inequality is actually a violation of our state equal protection provisions. And part of that inequality is based on race, is the, which we'll get into in a minute, is the fact that we are disproportionately harming children of color, we're harming English learners, we're harming those populations. So go to the next slide, or I can go to the next slide, yay. There we go. Okay, the petitioners in our case. So six school districts. We have William Penn School District as a name, um, and I think uh, folks are familiar with that particular district. We have Wilkes-Barre, School District of Lancaster, Panther Valley, Greater Johnstown, Shenandoah Valley. We also have parents from those school districts, Wilkes-Barre, William Penn, and Philadelphia. So at the time that we brought this lawsuit, one of your questions might be, why didn't we include Philadelphia as one of our named school districts? It's because it was under state control at the time. So we were not able to do that. But our case includes, I'm sorry, uh, our case includes parents from Philadelphia. Um, and so therefore all of the information about Philadelphia and the gross disparities and the inequity is, is going to be in this case. We also have and are very grateful for the NAACP, Pennsylvania State Conference, who is an organizational petitioner in our case, as well as Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools. Now, okay, I think someone else has control, sorry. So these are our respondents. So we have the actual leadership of our General Assembly. So we have uh, Senator Jake Corman and we have Representative Brian Cutler. We also have the governor and we also have Pennsylvania Department of Education as well as the school board of our state. Next slide. So what are we asking the court to do? We're asking them to declare the current system of school funding to be unconstitutional as violating both our equal, protect, our equal protection provision as well as the education clause, that it is built on entrenched inequities that are violating our equal protection provisions of our constitution. We're also violating the education clause because the General Assembly had a duty to ensure that all students are receiving a quality education in every school across the Commonwealth. We're asking them to order that the legislature cease using this inadequate, inequitable and uh, school funding system. And as Michael mentioned, there are a lot of irrationalities baked into this system, including hold harmless, that says that we're giving money to school districts that actually have decreased population in terms of student enrollment. And we're basing information on information in the 1990s, so it's irrational. It's also completely unpredictable. There's times when additional money may have gone to one school district over another. There's a lot that happens politically as part of this as well. 
And we're asking them to order the legislature to create and maintain a new equitable funding system that enables all students to meet state academic standards, which includes being college and career ready. That's the rigorous standard that's been set by our state. And that's the one we'll be focused on at trial. Next slide. So what do we need to prove? So for our, ad, for our education clause, we actually will be defining for the first time what that provision means. For the first time, we're going to, decide, going to determine, the court will determine what it means to have a thorough and efficient system of public education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth. And it is our belief and what we're alleging here is that that constitutional standard says that the school funding system and the education system in our Commonwealth has to work for every child. Children living in poverty, children who may have additional needs, that means you target additional dollars in order to meet their needs, as has been well documented by research and the literature. So, so we establish what is the constitutional standard. And part of that is that we already have a state legislature that has determined what some of those standards are. We've got a lot of academic standards. We've got them at the school level. We have them in our school code. And we have said that we embrace this idea that all students should be college and career ready. So that's the standard that we're looking at. So then asking how has it been met and how will you know? So how will we know when students are college and career ready, we have a lot of metrics that we can look at that will come into play in this lawsuit. We're looking not only at graduation rates and standardized test scores, we're looking at those remediation rates for kids who go to college and are they ready and college and career ready in terms of coming out of uh, the, the our schools. So we're trying to ensure that children are really receiving the resources they need in order to participate in a meaningful way in the economy, in order to participate in democracy, all of that is part of this. So we have a lot of metrics that we can look at to determine if kids are college and career ready. And if you look at the high wealth school districts, you will see that when children of poverty, living in poverty, for example, are attending schools in high wealth school districts, they're graduating. They're going to college. They are college and career ready. It goes to those resources that they are getting that kids in other low wealth school districts where we're overly reliant on local property taxes don't have those opportunities. We've got an incredible educational opportunity gap between the haves and the have nots in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have had at one time when it was uh, we had information on this the widest gaps between high wealth and low wealth school districts. We're also home to some of the most segregated school districts in the United States. So education clause, the, does it require more money in order to meet those standards? I think we already know the answer to that question. And how do we know that? Because we've had a costing out study that was done in 2007 that actually established adequacy targets that said, if you look at the current state standards, we know what it would, what you would need in order to educate a child. This is how much it, you would need, right? So we've been able to do it once in 2007. Since that study was done, the standards in Pennsylvania have actually become more rigorous. So we would do, a, you know, potentially we need to determine what are the, what is the adequacy? And what you see now, and we'll talk about in a minute, is the fact that even if you use those old numbers, adequacy targets from 2008 that you will see that we are already well behind, that we're already below those adequacy targets. So how much money does it, do we need to meet it? Um, uh, the, this issue has come up in our case, which is a little shocking and appalling um, and um, uh, you know, kind of unconscionable, but is it the student's fault? That does come up in our lawsuit because uh, who are the respondents looking at? They're saying, well, you know, they're not engaged, they're not coming to school, whatever the issues are. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Obviously, those who are in education know that there are a lot of resources that are needed in order to ensure that children are engaged in schools, that they're attending schools, and that the curriculum is working for them and all of that. So that's the adequacy part. Now, the inequity part is our equal protection claim. So we're gonna look at those wide disparities between high wealth and low wealth school districts and say, are they justified? And it is our position that they cannot possibly be justified. In looking at an equal protection claim, 
you look at what are you measuring? Is it a fundamental right? We are saying that education is a fundamental right. At least it's an important state right. Therefore, you would have to have a countervailing state interest that justifies these gross disparities. And we do not believe that there is any rational basis even for the great disparities we, we see between high wealth and low wealth school districts, particularly when we know, because we've had a funding formula that was adopted, recognizing that additional resources need to go to children living in poverty, poverty and concentrations of poverty, et cetera. We know that additional dollars need to be driven to low wealth school districts, and we are doing the opposite. And we are then blaming the localities for not raising enough funds when they are taxing at twice as rate at, the, at twice the rate of high wealth districts, and they are not at, they're not able to compensate for the lack of state funding. Next slide. So respondents' arguments. What do they say? Well, Pennsylvania is already a high spender. Um, we have well above the national average and students score high on the NEEP, which is a national uh, exam that is used and it's used across the country. So it's true that we have a lot of high spending school districts and high wealth areas across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So we do, there are some high spenders and it's like when we talk about if someone who's very, who has a lot of wealth walks into a bar and it changes sort of the percentage of, you know, oh, now uh, we have the, the bar is composed of people who have a lot of, a lot of wealth when it's actually that two people just who are wealthy enter the bar. So is it a high spender? Yes, but um, we are not spending enough on students who are in the, the low wealth school districts and students score high in the need. Yes, that we do have some high scoring school districts. Again, due to lack of resources, due to inadequate state funding, we have children in low wealth school districts who couldn't possibly receive the resources they need and they are not doing well on the NEEP. And we can show those disparities with, re with regard to the NEEP scores, the PSSA and the Keystone exams. New formula will solve all the problems, no not going to happen because that school funding formula just looked at how we are distributing the pie. It didn't add any new money to education funding at all. In fact, they didn't even look at adequacy. They just looked at, should we have additional weights so that we're targeting additional funding to school districts? And it only applies to quote unquote new money. So money added to basic education. And as Michael mentioned, we're up to 11% that it applies to. So of all the basic education funding going out, that fair funding formula is only applying to 11% of that money. So that's, so obviously it's not going to make a difference and children can't wait for uh, the decades that that would take. And if you, then the formula is only as good as the dollars that are driven through it. So unless we solve adequacy, we're not gonna solve inequity. Failing students have access to the same programs as successful students. We will show in our lawsuit that that is absolutely not the case. Each of our under uh, low wealth underfunded school districts will explain what they are able to provide um, and what, what they're not able to provide. And you can see that the resources are vastly different. And I'm sure that everyone here can come up with examples of that. Uh, funding does not explain the outcomes in Pennsylvania. This is an issue that they have raised. We've seen it in the context of depositions that we've done, that they're saying that it's not about school funding. Money really doesn't matter. That, um, that educational outcomes of students are due to other factors and it's not about the money. We have a lot of research that belies that notion and we certainly have the experiences of our superintendents and our parents in school districts that will explain that. In fact, ab absence of funding does explain these educational outcomes. And these investments can't be a one-time deal, right? You have to have a funding scheme that ensures a consistent investment in education over time. We have children who don't have access to preschool. We have kids who don't have access to full day kindergarten. So they're already starting behind when they're starting school. We're not investing in that. We're not investing K through 12 consistently to ensure that we have the systems in place, the resources, the instructional models, the meaning, the, the able to retain staff. If you look at school district of Philadelphia or to school district of Lancaster or William Penn, you will see the same 
issues over and over again. They can't compete with the salaries of some of the competing school districts. They don't have the resources. They have trouble attracting uh, staff to come there. And when people get there, they don't have the technology. We have school buildings that are falling apart in Philadelphia. We've got asbestos, we've got lead, we, they're unsafe. We have all of these issues that need to be addressed and it has to be consistent investments over time that really make the difference and that move the needle. Next slide. So where are we in this lawsuit? So we've completed what we call discovery. That means that we've exchanged information and documents over 100,000 pages of documents. We have conducted over 70 depositions, including one that Michael and I were involved in today. Um, we have exchanged expert reports and rebuttal reports about very important areas of inquiry. Does money matter? Does money make a difference? What is this school funding system like currently in Pennsylvania? And who, how, does it disproportionately impact children in low wealth school districts? Does it, it impact students based on race? All of those are in our expert reports. So there were two summary judgment motions that were filed, uh, one by the State Board of Ed, who said they shouldn't be in this lawsuit at all. We said that they're an indispensable party and they will remain in the lawsuit. In addition, because we did file this lawsuit in 2014, we have had some students who've actually graduated from school. So there was a motion that the parents of those who have graduated should no longer be in the lawsuit. The uh, judge in our case, uh, ruled that in fact this is such an such an issue of public importance that despite what we call the mootness doctrine that the children are no longer in school we're going to allow the parents to stay in the case because this uh, case is so important. So trial is expected uh, within the next few months. We don't have a trial date yet, but we will certainly let you know when we do. Next slide. So I just want to underscore a few things here. And one is the inequities with regard to race and class disparities that have come to light. Um, obviously over history, over time, a lot of reasons for that, a lot of racism, a lot of systemic structural racism that is built into this. But here's where we are. Pennsylvania school districts are among the most segregated by race and class of any in the United States. And that's according to a study that was done. Districts receiving the most revenue are disproportionately white. Districts receiving the least revenue, so like in the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% in terms of wealth, per, in terms of revenues per student and expenditures per student, disproportionately Black and Latinx. 50% of Black students, 40% of Latinx students attend Pennsylvania's lowest districts. So but that's, I'm sorry, the bottom quintile there. Um, and they're also among the most underfunded. Uh, one study found that Pennsylvania school districts with the fewest white students are shortchanged in state funding by almost 2,000 per pupil. I think it is more now since that study was conducted. While the districts with the most white students receive about 2,000 more per pupil than their quote, fair share under the fun funding formula. And that was a study that was done by David Mozenkis of Power, an excellent study. So these racial disparities are really troubling. And if you look at the civil rights data, you will find that in terms of educational opportunities, there are great gaps. And, and one, among, again, the greatest in the nation with regard to disparities um, of educational opportunities. So access to AP courses, access to technology, uh, all of those issues are are in the civil rights data and underscore the importance of this. And didn't we all see this during this COVID crisis in terms of the high wealth white school districts that were able to pivot to online learning because they already had those computers and systems in place compared to our low wealth um, and majority, for example, Philadelphia school district that struggled in order to get funding to get laptops to all the children. So we've seen this time and time again. We see it in Chester Upland, we see it in a lot of other districts as well. Next slide. So we need to show that all students can learn. I was shocked that this came up as an issue in this litigation, but it is an issue whether all children can learn. Obviously we know that they can, 
we are going to show that all students can learn, and that's obviously clear, and that money matters. Now, how do we know that money matters? Because a lot of research has been done in this area, in part coming out of school funding litigation, such as ours. So they tracked those states that added uh, education funding after a lawsuit, a school funding for a school funding lawsuit similar to ours. And what they found is that if you invest over time, K through 12, academic outcomes improve, uh, graduation rates improve, you've got kids who are college and career ready, and you also find lifetime uh, really benefits of this, benefits that go to the Commonwealth, et cetera. You've got decreases in unemployment, you've got increases in revenue going to the state because uh, people are engaged in meaningful employment, all of those things happen. And the research is clear that it makes a difference. Research is clear that schools, if they're given resources to counter the effects of poverty, it makes a significant difference. High quality preschool has to be universal, has to be predictable across the board. Smaller class sizes, another issue that we see in all of our petitioner school districts, we see that they have large class sizes. One of the depositions I remember when the students said, this classroom that I'm in that has 32 kids in it is like trying to learn on a subway. That's what it's like for me. Highly qualified teachers, culturally relevant curriculum, access to school counselors. A lot of our low funded school districts don't have enough school counselors, school nurses, and we know what a significant difference that makes. Academic outcomes we know improve significantly with these investments that time over time, research over research, underscores that these intervention strategies make a difference. Next slide. So how much do districts need? So one of the expert reports in our case looked at those adequacy targets that were adopted uh, after the costing out study in 2007 and looked at and sort of updated it based on the cost of living and said, we need, and this is again, based on a costing out study that was done on different uh, state standards, that we need an additional 4.6 billion to close education gaps. So think about that. So it was calculated by uh, Dr. Matt Kelly of Penn State in the expert report, more than half of all school districts are more than $2,000 per, per student behind. So in terms of adequacy gaps, it's across the Commonwealth. It's in rural areas, it's in suburban areas, it's in urban areas. So there is a map on the website that actually you can um, navigate it so that you can see what the funding shortfall is per student for your particular school districts. And so you go to fundourschoolspa.org, you can go to the map and you can see what the um, amount is that they are underfunded by based on the adequacy gap that was identified in the expert report. So here are some examples. You see Philadelphia, $5,583, that's per student. Lancaster, William Penn, Upper Darby, Norristown, Chester Upland. So you can see what would this mean? Think about it in a classroom of 25 students, what additional money we're talking about there. Next slide. So again, this is a, this is a conservative estimate because it's actually based on less rigorous academic standards um, that were used at that time when the costing out study was based on information in 2005. Now we've got the core curriculum. Now we have higher standards. It doesn't account for 3 billion pension cost spike or charter costs. So that's significant as well, right? We have a mandate there in terms of the, the pension costs. Those have been significant. Those have climbed over time. And again, that has disproportionately impacted our low wealth school district. So with the new basic education funding weights, um, increases to 4.8 billion. If we're looking at the students living in poverty, concentrations of poverty, English learners, the weights is what adds the money based on student need. So it's more than 4.6, it goes up to 4.8. And again, a conservative estimate. Next slide. So Wolf's proposal, a uh, Governor Wolf's proposal for new funding. 1.35 billion into basic education funding targeted heavily to underfunded districts. 
uh, and under his approach, 200 million in new special education funding. That is significant because special education costs have risen dramatically in the last few years and disproportionately the local share has been far greater than the state share and that they've borne the brunt of that. And that's been, was actually flat funded for a long time and then a kind of a few shots at an extra 100 million each time. 30 million for pre-K and Head Start. We know that makes a significant difference. We know that early childhood education makes a significant difference in long-term uh, educational benefits. However, um, it has been called dead on arrival and perhaps uh, Senator Vincent Hughes will address this, um, but this is Governor Wolf's proposal. We don't anticipate that this will be successful or this will go anywhere, but perhaps there is more news to share on that. So why don't we just send all the state funding through the formula? Does it fix the problem? And the answer to that is no, because the formula doesn't set a benchmark for what students need and how much the state should contribute. All it says is based on the current pie, this is the amount, uh, these are sort of the weights that should go to schools based on, on student need and based on district need and, and tax effort, et cetera. So the formula itself will not solve the problem. As we talked about, there isn't enough money that is going through it. You need to add money to it in order for it to be effective and to be successful. So William Penn School District would get 914 more per student if there was no hold harmless. So hold harmless is an issue that a lot of people have kicked down the road that nobody's looking at that people need to look at. William Penn School District, $4,836 per student behind the target for adequate funding in state law. So again, when we talk about that adequacy gap, it doesn't come out of nowhere. After the costing out study, there's actually legislation that was adopted that said, we're gonna establish these adequacy targets. We're gonna to try to fund them over time. Unfortunately, that never, that although it's still on the books, it was never implemented. So it wouldn't change the system that's still overly reliant on local taxpayers. So again, we are sixth or sometimes seventh, sometimes third in terms of that local, in terms of that state share to education, that state contribution. We are overly reliant on local taxpayers. That's a lot of what drives the inequity that we see across the board. We need to solve that problem and sending all the state funding through the formula doesn't solve that problem. So what the pandemic reveals, I think I talked about this a little bit, but the COVID crisis, we saw schools close, we saw wealthier districts that had ventilation, that had a system in place, that had uh, the computers and laptops and Chromebooks able to take home. They were able to pivot and they were able to actually do a better job in terms of meeting the needs of students. If there was ever crying out an emblematic situation of saying money matters, I think it's now. I think it's with the COVID crisis and what we see there. So the American Rescue Plan, um, this is for the COVID relief bill. This is what was adopted. It, it has 5 billion for schools across the Commonwealth. That's, it, that's terrific, but it is a temporary one-time fix, right? These federal funds require cautious spending. You cannot, it's only going to last for a few years. It's not something that you can build on. You can't start a reading program and continue it for all your students because the money is going to actually drop out. You're going to have what we call a cliff. If folks remember the Great Recession, we had the ERA money, the American Recovery Act money. And when that was given to school districts, then there was a cliff after that because the federal money came in, state funding was reduced, they didn't have a funding to continue what they're doing. In both cases, school districts are getting the message that they shouldn't be spending that on anything that they think will be long-term. It's a one-time fix. You, you can put it into your ventilation, into your PPE. There are also specific prohibitions around how that money can be used. So it's not going to address the entrenched inequities that we have in our system. This money alone is not going to do it. So I'm, uh, what the lawsuit can accomplish. So studies show that funding lawsuits bring more revenue than the state would otherwise have raised because these funding lawsuits are a check on our legislature. What the Supreme Court held when it, um, uh, just to give you a little bit about the history of the case, 
This funding lawsuit, when we first brought it, was dismissed by the Commonwealth Court. We went up on appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, who held in September of 2017 that the case could move forward. And part of that rationale of the judge at that time, Justice Weck, was to say that this is a check on our General Assembly. General Assembly has an obligation to fund our schools and have a thorough and efficient system of public education. And the judiciary, the court, is a check to make sure that they have fulfilled that constitutional mandate. So these school funding cases allow courts to allow you to go back into court if the funding isn't happening, if it isn't going. So it's a very, very important um, check on the system. And it's also a way to, to change this log jam that we've had in Harrisburg for so long. So it brings more revenue than the state would otherwise have raised on its own. We think that's certainly true in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It will increase academic achievement and lifetime success of students. And that's what you see if you look at what's called the 25 year study, look at all of these lawsuits that have been brought. Have they changed things? Absolutely. They've changed not only educational outcomes, but lifetime outcomes and uh, actually benefits for the state long term. So I think that's where we're going to end for now, but we'd love to have a chance to answer questions. But before we get into that, I did want to underscore what can you do? Because this case, which Michael will say as well, is only going to work because of advocacy around this lawsuit. We need advocacy of our state legislators. We need advocacy to actually move this forward. The court can make a ruling and then the, the state respondents may challenge it or the state respondents can drag their heels in implementing it. But if there is advocacy across the Commonwealth, if there's a groundswell of that kind of pressure on state legislators, they, this will move it along. We know this because we see it in other states as well. When there is advocacy around these school funding lawsuits, that's when things change. That's when they come up with a real systemic change to change the outcomes for students and for the state. So we really invite you to sign up to stay informed about the case, to get involved in some advocacy campaigns. Think about writing an op-ed talking about what you've experienced, what your children have experienced. Talk about the disparities that you've seen and why you think this can make a difference. So I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? Thanks. So volunteer to share the, your school funding story. There's actually a page on the, on the website where you can do that to share a school funding story, write letters to the editor, your local newspaper, put information out there on social media, talk to people about this, email Pennsylvania legislatures and organize a presentation for your own organization if you're interested. And we certainly wanna spend the rest of the time answering your questions. And it seems like there are a few of them in the chat. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael and Mara, for your presentation. It was very thorough and very comprehensive in terms of laying out the problem and the possible solution. Uh, before I turn it over to Paul, who will tackle the questions, we want to spend a few minutes to uh, bring Senator Vincent Hughes to the screen to talk briefly about um, what it means to advocate and why this is an issue. And, um, and as you mentioned, Maura, uh, the need for advocacy on at the state level and, and the need for um, individuals, the legislators to kind of understand this as a tireless uh, champion and a, a commitment and, a, and passion for this issue, Senator Hughes has been in the front line fighting for the Commonwealth. I want to give him a few minutes to talk about if this issue, its impact, and why it's necessary for us to uh, be, at, be, be at the table. So Senator Vincent Hughes, as always, um, thank you for joining us. I want I believe you're still here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, Thomas. Oh, great, 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 great. Floor is yours, you. sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and you like you flooring everybody with the baby there, right? You know, no one can concentrate because you're bringing the baby on, and there, there you have it. All right. So, Trying to stop them early, sir. Trying to stop them early, sir. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, so just let me just say thank you to Michael uh, and Mara for. Um, uh, making this presentation and making this presentation available to everyone. I think they've taken a lot of information and distilled it to uh, what I think is relatively simple and understandable um, for folks to really see how this manifests itself, how this plays itself out um, with respect to the discrimination that's going on 
and with respect to what's lost when we don't educate everyone equally and adequately. Okay, so those are two, I think, two important words um, that we must keep pushing forward in this conversation, the issue of equal equity and the issue of adequacy. Um, and, and, and this has been going on, this problem in education has going on, been going on for centuries. This is not just a short-term uh, problem. This problem is, is, has been going on because quite frankly, the, 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 the history of this nation is one that makes sure that the education goes to those who have and not necessarily to those who don't have. All of you remember um, uh, and have read about the times when it was illegal to educate black and brown uh, children. You would be killed or, or put in jail if you were found elect, uh, educating black and brown children. This is just a manifestation of that history. Um, and, and so uh, the thing that, that uh, uh, angered me, and I put it in the chat, was the fact that and I hope everybody picked up on this, the fact that um, raised in the context of the legal arguments, raised by the other side, that do they really believe that all children can learn? Do they really believe, do we really believe that all children can learn at the same level? That all children have the skills to learn? On its face, that's obviously insulting but it gives you an, a, a clearer picture of what it is that we're dealing with uh, in, uh, in this fight. Uh, and, and so what we're, what we're asking folks uh, is, is to get involved, get organized, talk about this, distribute this uh, uh, presentation. It's accessible and available. Make sure that everyone is in, in, in involved, involved in this conversation, involved in this fight. This is a moral, this is a fundamental fight for the future of this city, this state, and this nation. It's a fundamental fight for our personal um, success. Remember, remember that when, when we don't un unlock the genius in our children's minds, then we're blocking that genius from materializing. We're blocking the blessings that can come from that genius. The difficulty of solving problems that are vexing problems that we're all confronted with uh, is, is, I believe, is fundamentally locked in some, some schoolroom, some classroom that's being severely underfunded. Uh, you know, so, so we, we don't just, it is, this is not just a moral crisis. This is, uh, we are attacking ourselves when we don't fund the schools equally and adequately. And so we all got to get behind this lawsuit. We all got to get on the mission. Um, I believe get on the mission of trying to uh, effectuate uh, the success of, of Governor Wolf's proposal that doesn't end everything, uh, but it certainly uh, would mark a sea change uh, in what would happen in um, at least with respect to the fair funding formula in Pennsylvania and for low income school districts, it would have a dramatic impact in new resources that would go into uh, a, a, a discriminated uh, school districts for decades. It have a dramatic impact. We all need to get behind that. And the, the ironic thing is that the way the governor has, has crafted it, uh, he's made sure that there's more funds in, in the in available for all school districts to get extra dollars and that no school district would be hurt in this process. Uh, the, those that have been discriminated against the most would be would get the, the, a, a serious dramatic jump and increase um, in their funding. Uh, so we need to be involved. We need to be engaged. We need to tell folks what's, what's going on. Uh, I know we're all completely absorbed with the pandemic uh, and, and, the, and I know we're completely absorbed um, with the violence in our communities, the gun violence in our communities. Uh, but, but be clear, be clear, if we had fully funded schools, if we had equitably and adequately funded schools, 
you know, maybe we would be we would have enough resources in our schools, enough teachers, up to date um, uh, material, uh, um, uh, new uh, supervisors and, and and counselors and all kinds of individuals in the school that could help our young people see a different path, and they wouldn't have to resort to the madness that's going on in our communities right now. So this has a ripple effect. You know, our colleges are complaining right now, and, and I'll bring this my comments to a close. Our colleges and universities are complaining right now because they're, they're complaining that there's a shortage of, of students graduating high school uh, to attend college, and we're going to have to shut down schools, and we're going to have to cut back programs, and, and, and that which we used to have will not be able to provide anymore because we don't have enough students. Well, you know what, darn it, if we had educated the students equitably and adequately, we'd be graduating more students able to attend college and get a degree or a license or a certificate. Then we, the, our universities would not have to have this crisis and we would be a much better society, more enlightened and ready to move forward. Um, so I thank everyone for their participation. Again, I thank um, always our friends at the Urban League uh, for, for being on the case, um, Mara and, and Michael, and we won't say how many years I've known and worked with Michael, um, but I thank all of y'all for just laying this presentation out in a way that, pe that makes sense to people and that people can then share this information with others and get on board with this fight. This is one of the fundamental fights of our generation, of our time. And we've got to win it. Everything is on our side to win it. We've got to execute and go all the way through to the end and win this for our children and for ourselves. Thank you. That's exactly right, Senator. Thank you, um, Paul Sokolar. I'm going to uh, try to recap some of the questions and get some quick answers maybe in the next 10 minutes or so, because we've uh, promised you to, to wrap up here. Um, first question, we had a, a couple of people ask about the case history, and it's been nearly seven years since the case was first filed. Is that normal? What, what, do you, what can you tell us about the, uh, the, the time that's involved here? It's, I, I know it feels like an extraordinary long time. Um, I have to say that because the case did go up on appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, we first filed it, we were thrown out of court. They said, this is not what we call, this is a political question. It's not justiciable. We, courts can't look at this at all, which was the ruling back in the 1990s in Pennsylvania. And so it took many years to bring it up to the Supreme Court get that ruling, bring it back down. And then we had a lot of discovery disputes, a lot of back and forth. We had to take over 70 depositions and go through all of the discovery. And um, as people know who've ever been involved with litigation, there's often a lot of back and forth and, and time disappears under that. And there were a number of objections and motions and all of that. So unfortunately, it has taken an inordinately long period of time. We spent a lot of time trying to get the judge to move it more quickly and force them to have less time to respond to things, but this is where we are now. Good question. Great. Um, a few questions about where Philadelphia fits into this in terms of dollars. Um, I think some folks were surprised not to see it on that list of the 10 most uh, uh, underfunded uh, under due to hold harmless. Um, the, the, I, I believe the total shortfall for Philadelphia through Hold Har Harmless is $440 million, but um, questions about uh, like would the local, um, the, eliminating the local tax abatement, would that um, be more than a drop in the bucket? What, what, what's, the, what's the gap here? Well, look, this is a very important question. Uh, uh, the, the fundamental fact, although much of the state thinks, seems to think that whenever somebody complains about underfunding, it's really a, a, a front to get money to Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is not actually uh, the worst uh, off district in the state. Uh, 
uh, it's pretty badly off, okay? Uh, and in total dollar amounts, it's way, way, way off. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, but that's because it's, it's such a big district. Uh, but it is, uh, there are many other districts that are being treated uh, just as badly. Uh, and it's important to recognize that why it's the, uh, the black and the brown districts that are really uh, seeing it uh, worst. Uh, there are many, many poor underfunded uh, uh, districts uh, in the rural areas too. Uh, there are white districts that are underfunded. Uh, this is uh, uh, historically because of the way we fund our schools. Uh, the, uh, it really is a, a, a much bigger problem uh, for the uh, Philadelphia and the other uh, uh, urban centers. Uh, but uh, the, the refusal of the state legislature to do its job and to make sure that schools are adequately funded uh, is a problem uh, uh, everywhere. As uh, uh, Maura said, half of the school districts in the state are uh, uh, underfunded by more than $2,000. So Philadelphia is, uh, has the most to gain in terms of total dollars, uh, but not the most to gain in terms of uh, dollars per student. Uh, uh, they are uh, probably, I think, uh, somewhere around 15th or 16th uh, 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 lowest uh, funded uh, uh, by uh, 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 on a per student basis. They were not in the top 10. Uh, it is a really important dollars uh, for Philadelphia. Uh, the second question that was asked, would um, uh, getting rid of tax abatement solve the problem? Uh, I only wish it could. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, certainly it's been a source of the, of the problems Philadelphia has uh, uh, raising its own local money, uh, but Philadelphia locally could not begin uh, to solve the problem itself. This is a problem that comes from Harrisburg and its refusal to put enough money into the pot. Thanks. Um, on the subject of districts that are in or not in the lawsuit, uh, somebody's asking about Allentown, which is, I believe, the third largest district in the state and is not in the lawsuit. Maybe you can say a little bit about um, how it happens to be that it's these six districts. Well, these six districts, uh, frankly, uh, deserve everybody's uh, 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 applause. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, willingness uh, to put up with uh, a lot of work. Uh, as you more said, uh, they had to uh, submit themselves to hours and hours and hours of depositions. They had to uh, provide over 100,000 pages of uh, documents. Uh, uh, and uh, they needed to deal with uh, uh, the uh, threat of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, not being looked on favorably uh, by uh, uh, the legislature. Uh, and that was, uh, frankly, a very important factor uh, for Allentown, uh, where uh, their state senator uh, got them uh, uh, some extra money uh, that was very useful and important to them about the time that this suit was being filed. So uh, I think, uh, uh, in the end, uh, they uh, uh, probably uh, thought it was better to wait and see uh, how other districts did than stick up their, their own neck out. Uh, the, um, that was uh, a problem uh, with a lot of districts. And as I said, I think uh, uh, these are a very brave and courageous group of districts and we should all be very thankful uh, that they've been willing to uh, uh, be the front runners for everybody else in the state. And that says a lot about the irrationality of the system that we have that. We also have a number of districts such as York and Harrisburg, Scranton, you know, Reading is another example that, that in some instances were under some kind of state receivership or state control. And they would also be um, districts that would be involved in the lawsuit otherwise, including Philadelphia. Okay, um, Maura, you talked about the claims under the state constitution, and one question was whether there are also potentially claims under federal law, uh, if whatever happens with this case. Well, Michael, uh, if this doesn't work, I say we go elsewhere. Uh, we'll see where we are. But uh, you know, right now we're focused on this case. Most of these cases have been brought under state constitutions 
um, because there is not a right to education per se in the US constitution. There are other constitutional claims that you can have um, that you could pursue in terms of equal protection claims, for example, but it is not something, and there's a Rodriguez case that San Antonio that folks may remember that was brought back in the 70s that tried this and said, every kid should have a right to education. And what the court said was, no, this is not something that's actually in our federal US constitution. If you your state constitutions allow for such a right, that is where you should be bringing these cases. And in fact, that's why out of the 50 states, I believe it's 47 that have brought these cases. I don't think that anyone, uh, frankly, thinks that the court has gotten more liberal or more likely uh, to favor uh, these kinds of suits uh, now, uh, given uh, the many, many years of uh, uh, appointments uh, uh, by uh, conservative Republicans. Uh, and so, uh, frankly, uh, we're very hopeful uh, that we have a strong grounds here in the state. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it would take a, a lot of thought uh, if we don't pre prevail here. But I don't think that's the question. I really think the question is, how do we prevail here so that right. we don't have to rely on the federal courts? Yeah. It's not a great option right now, as you all know. Uh, just two more quick ones. A um, couple of comments about the lack of funding for early education. Do you want to say a word about the... Um, how early education fits into this case? It fits in like a glove, okay? It's a perfect example of how backwards and how uh, uh, badly Pennsylvania does it. Uh, until Governor Rendell became governor, uh, there was no state funding for preschool at all. Uh, we, have, uh, we are no longer one of the few states that have no funding, uh, but we are still uh, doing a very poor job of it. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, the figures will show that uh, more than half of the state's children, uh, well, more than half of the state's children are not in uh, 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 high quality uh, pre uh, preschool. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly uh, we need to close that gap. Uh, the research is uh, really strong uh, that uh, the earlier you address uh, uh, problems so that students don't fall behind, uh, the easier it is. You know, remediation is should never uh, be used uh, when prevention is available. Uh, it's much cheaper uh, and much better, uh, and you don't get labeled. Uh, and uh, the fact that the state is so far behind on this is just a part and parcel of the fact that it has not put a priority on education. That's the underlying problem here. And it's time that they uh, start figuring out what's, uh, what's really necessary for both its, uh, for the individuals in the state to uh, be successful and for the state itself, as uh, uh, Senator Hughes said, uh, to be able to uh, uh, meet its own goals. And the evidence-based research couldn't be clearer of all issues. It's incredibly clear at Stark, and it's been a part of almost every one of these school funding lawsuits to say that preschool investment, early education is a priority. Other states have made it a priority, and it's made a difference. Um, do you want to speak to the likelihood that the legislature does something prior to a mandate from the Supreme Court, assuming that this... Uh, case gets appealed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? Sure. Uh, I think it's nil. Uh, I think uh, they have shown uh, very little uh, uh, interest in actually doing it, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try uh, and make sure that they understand uh, that's a problem. Uh, I actually think I should change it. It's nil until we change the legislature. Right. Uh, we do have elections coming up. Uh, uh, on the legislature uh, uh, in another year from now, uh, which will give them an opportunity uh, to be able to uh, uh, decide that they want to uh, uh, change direction. Uh, but uh, every sign from this year's legislature is that they're not moving uh, unless, unless uh, we see an awful lot more advocacy and, 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 and willingness to, uh, 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 to, to put the heat on them than we've seen before. But uh, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will yield to the Senator on this one. Thank, thank you, Michael. And I, I did want to comment on this. And, and so I just, what I want folks to understand is that 
the governor's proposal for to drive all the money through the fair funding formula and to increase money to every school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on its face, since no one is hurt and everybody is helped, on its face should be a slam dunk. When you think about it, on its face, every school district gets help, the fair funding formula gets adopted, and we finally got equity for everyone and that the opportunity to create a stronger commonwealth um, increases dramatically because there's more money going into education and it's funded equitably and everyone gets a chance to get the skills to realize their dreams. Now, now, now so, so that is a fundamental piece that we should not look away from. Here's the, here is where my colleagues are getting antsy about this. And I might be being kind, Michael. All right, here's where my colleagues are getting antsy about this. The governor has proposed to pay for this. He wants an increase in the personal income tax that, we all, that only in his proposal, only a third of the people in Pennsylvania would pay that increase. Listen to me now. Only a third of the people in Pennsylvania would have to pay for the increase. Those would be the, the folks with a little bit more um, economic capacity. They would be the ones that have to pay this. The other two thirds would either, their personal income tax would stay, stay um, the same or others would not have to pay any at all. So this, the, the whole notion, the whole notion of having to pay a little bit more is what essentially my Republican colleagues are balking against and they don't like the idea of having to do that. Now, my response to that is this, and I've had this conversation with the governor. We can, money is, is what, fungible. We can talk about how to pay for a concept. There's other ways that, that and other dollars that can be utilized to pay for the idea of his proposal but let's not get lost in the rightness of the proposal because we've got to, we can't quite figure out how to get it paid for. So that is, that is the rub. And I think, and I'm, this, I'm speaking for my own, but I think I'm on safe ground here. I think it is, it is fundamental for all of us to talk about funding and more funding, equitable funding, and adequate funding. And that should happen immediately. You guys figure out how to pay for it, but we gotta get the concept right. If we're not successful, if we're not successful, then I think it only, it winds up really kind of strengthening the case. It proves that the General Assembly is incapable of getting this job done. And I think it winds up strengthening the, the, the case. Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so Michael and Mar would have to, have to determine that. But we need to not get lost in the how it's paid for. We need to get focused on what needs to be done and then we'll figure out how it gets paid for. Let me just back up what the, the Senator said was that the, the, the really uh, strong and genius part of the governor's proposal is that he has taken the debate about hold harmless and, uh, and, and removed it from the question of, are you gonna take money from one group and give it to another? And said, no, that's not the way to do it. You fix it, you run it through the formula and you, and, 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 and you, and, and you pay back enough money so that you haven't taken any away uh, from anyone. You're putting more money in the pot so that you can uh, begin to get this equity. Uh, and he was the first one to say, uh, in, in effect, uh, let's make sure uh, that we're uh, not, uh, that this isn't a, a winners and losers, but a way that we can convert this so that there are no losers and only winners in the fight. And as, as, as the Senator said, uh, it should be a, a really a, a, an easy call, uh, given uh, that structure. Uh, and uh, the, it's really up to the legislature to figure out uh, how they're gonna pay for this uh, or make sure that there is sufficient money uh, so that we can do it. 
because in the end, the idea that we have these huge disparities in how much money is going for one child's education uh, as against another child's education is just intolerable, immoral, and cannot last. All right, I'm gonna turn it back to Thomas with this last question, which is really a comment, which is, if money doesn't matter, then why don't the wealthy districts just give it away? Absolutely. <laughs> it is uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, strangest arguments around. Everybody in the world knows that you can, uh, that when it takes more resources, when you need more teachers, uh, 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 when you uh, uh, want to make something uh, better, uh, you put me more resources into it and resources cost money. And uh, only an academic uh, would argue that money doesn't matter here. And hopefully uh, that argument has not succeeded uh, in any other court and we're hoping it doesn't succeed here. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think it's it's outrageous to say it doesn't matter. Everyone knows it does. Everyone's ex own experience is that it makes a tremendous difference and that's how everyone is making decisions. So it's, uh, it, it is, uh, some of the arguments they have made in this case have been immoral and unconscionable and, and outrageous. And uh, I, I do think that the, the notion that they are trying to shift the blame onto the students, onto other people uh, is, is something that we really need to uh, attack head on. It's really racist. Thank you. Great. Great. So with that, we wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening. I uh, wanna thank the lawyers um, and all the partners the, that helped us bring this event. I wanna thank Senator Hughes once again. Thank Andrea Custis and her leadership at the Urban League of Philadelphia. As we mentioned, we'll, add, we'll be able to email you if you registered a copy of the presentation. We also encourage you to look at the, the chat. Our next event is Monday, where if you're interested, we'll be talking a little bit more about how schools are funded. So a little bit of an education 101. Um, a link is in the chat so that if you're interested in joining us for this conversation, so that you can understand how schools are funded. In addition, I included a link to contact your legislator. One of the things that is important to note is that this fight is, in, is a fight in Harrisburg. And it's important to think about not just yourself, but think about areas of the Commonwealth where people live in areas where their legislator may not be for funding our schools. And I would encourage you to give them a call and give them an opportunity, one, to follow this presentation, but two, give them tools and give them the encouragement to contact their legislator and ask them to legislate. You know, for those that are in this chat, if you live in Senator Vincent Hughes district, you can already hear from his passion that he's passionate about this fight. But there are his, some of his colleagues that are not so passionate. They may need a little bit of a, a little kick, a kick in their uh, butt a little bit to kind of understand this issue and understand why it's important that the Commonwealth does right by all of its students. So uh, we encourage you to follow that link and more importantly, take action by encouraging not only people that live in your district, but think about people that don't live in a district, that people that live in districts that their legislator may be voting against or may be against this issue and encourage them to contact their legislator because ultimately this fight is a Harrisburg fight. As much as we wanna put pressure on our school districts and our superintendent, this is a Harrisburg fight and it's important to contact the legislators and let them hear, let them know that they need to do right by their students. So with that, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to sharing more information. Please make sure to follow all the partners um, that joined us this evening and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you too.